whole bunch of different stories that we're going to cover today. We're going to be covering something that I thought was pretty problematic and really frustrating that happened in a committee meeting in the House of Commons this month. That's what the, the title and thumbnail are about. But we're also going to talk about what Carolyn Rogers, the head of the Bank of Canada, or one of the heads of the Bank of Canada, deputy minister, said in a recent speech this month. Some key takeaways from that. We're going to be giving you the, the highlights from that as well as what's been going on with this bank collapse that's going on in the States and how that could impact Canadians. Uh, and then finally, if we have some time for it, maybe we'll go into some of the new allegations on the alleged election interference. Obviously a lot to catch up on. It's been a busy week um, for me on my end and that's why we're doing this and getting into so much depth and so much content here today. If you're joining me live, let me know that you're here in the comment section. Um, I can sort of see you uh, right here when you pop up and you hit your, hit your chat, which is good to see. Uh, yeah, good to see you, Susan, popping in. But the first thing I wanted to show you, let's dive right into the content here so that you can um, get a vibe of what's going on today. We had a committee meeting, sort of like a hearing, in the House of Commons this week. Um, this was the Agriculture Committee meeting. Don't need to worry about it because it's not, we're not talking about specifically farming here. What we're talking about is the heads of major global uh, or major Canadian grocery chains. Uh, and they were actually summoned and, and brought in front of uh, the, the House of Commons committee. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, not specifically with what they said, but specifically with what one politician said and the tone at which this politician sort of took into this committee, me committee meeting that I think was really not helpful. Yeah, and, and good to see folks tuning in here. We've got Susan and, and Vita and Baron and Sophia and Tony. Uh, great to see you, my friends. It's good to see you. All right. So, the, the, the whole point for why these people are coming in, and let me actually just uh, flip over to this view so you can see um, the context of what, what I'm talking about here. So, <coughs> excuse me. The, the, the reason these, these heads of the grocery stores were brought in front of this committee meeting was to figure out, okay, to what extent are these, these grocery stores making inflation worse? Like, is inflation, is this inflation or is it greedflation? Uh, can we get the data to determine whether or not these banks are making more money off of the backs of Canadians who are having to buy food, right, and raising food prices more than expected? This is something that the NDP, and that's why Jagmeet Singh here is on screen, um, this is something that the NDP have been absolutely hammering for the past like three or four months um, saying that the, uh, inflation the, isn't um, a, an issue uh, the, uh, largely with monetary policy or some of the other concerns, the, the, the global concerns. He's saying, no, it's people right inside of our country, like these grocery store CEOs that are taking uh, the or uh, taking more money and as, as a result you're having to pay more and that's what's driving inflation. Now, this committee meeting was actually pretty productive and uh, we talked about this on the channel before. And uh, these, uh, like Galen Weston, who's one of the people who's most heavily questioned here, sort of brings information about, okay, here's where our profits are growing. Um, here's where they're not. Um, here's where our revenue's growing. Um, this is this is, uh, this is is pretty interesting. I know that people are going to have split takes on this. Let me show you some of these key highlights that I have here. I, I've actually watched this whole thing. And I want to sort of start with some of the uh, more aggressive stuff that, uh, that Jagmeet Singh comes at Weston with. Um, and that is right around the 171350. And other parliamentarians inside of this uh, House of Commons committee are actually pretty pissed at Jagmeet Singh for what he just said here. Uh, so, so let's listen in, and then I'll, I'll pause it and give some more context, and we'll hop around this clip so I can give you the most interesting or most um, uh, important stuff. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a good thing for me to do. I need to update chat so that you can see yourselves here. Um, going to change that to that. And now you should be able to see the chat. Okay, there we go. Good to see you all here uh, on this Sunday. Hope you got enough sleep with the uh, the clocks going forward. So, so listen in on this. Let me slow this down. That that goes to show you. That's how fast I watch these things. At I try to um, I try to get through as much content as I can so I can pre-watch this stuff and bring you guys only the most important stuff. So let me uh, get my little code here to uh, to slow this back down to speed. Um, we'll put it in the console and normal speed. We should be good to go now. All right, let's hit it. There is one of our, our good parliamentarians, so uh, over to you for up to six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to set the stage. My question goes directly to Mr. Weston. Right now, we're not just going through unprecedented period of cost of living crisis. We have families going into your stores, looking at the price of items, looking at them and putting them back because they can't afford them. We have families that are struggling to buy food for their kids in this country, in a G7 country. And they look at you and they see you making record profits. How can you justify that 
when families are struggling to put food on the table for their kids. Thank you. Um, you know, we feel uh, and understand that uh, 95 percent of Canadians are concerned about food prices. Um, but grocery chain profits um, are not the reason for food inflation. And as I mentioned... Profit is too much profit. Well, so a company needs some degree of profit. Um, Record you know, profits more than you've ever Mr. made? Singh, ever? I'm gonna, Mr. Singh, I'm going to stop you there. Of course, your time is your time. And I can appreciate that. But we've invited, in fact, we've summoned these witnesses to come here. You ask a question. All, every member of this committee is expected to be able to hear the response. Sir. And I need you to certainly be a little bit more mindful of making sure that is. I know it's your time, and I'll give you that discretion. But please don't cross lines here. So back to you. So Singh actually gets reprimanded here for, for the tone he takes against Weston. Um, this, this is where it sort of gets a little bit, um, a little bit interesting, right? Because uh, if, and we're going to hop around on this committee meeting so you can see different clips here, but this is an entirely different tone than the rest of the meeting had. Um, here we see Singh coming in and he's angry. He's mad at Weston saying, how dare you do this? How dare you make it so that Canadians have to pay more um, for their food? This is your fault. You're making so much profit to which uh, Galen Weston says, well, actually uh, we're, we have to have a little bit of profit um, in order to actually make sure that our grocery stores stay open and that we can grow our business and expand to more chains. That profit doesn't go directly to, to me as CEO. It, it goes into the running of this business. Uh, and, and that's something that Singh sort of doesn't, doesn't hear here. Like it, it, baseline, the thing that I'm frustrated about is it seems that the, the, the lines of questioning that happened inside of this committee meeting, um, specifically from Jagmeet Singh, were not about getting to the, the getting to any solutions, getting to how we can solve this stuff. And I'll show you what, what sort of questions actually were like that in a moment, but more about getting a social media clip that will make people who aren't following this as closely as we are think, hey, that guy is standing up for me. I'm paying a lot for grocery prices, so that person is doing good for me, um, even if he's not sort of working towards a solution here in my frame of view. And again, if you disagree with me, that's okay. Um, that, that, that's kind of the point of this channel. But I'll show you some reasons that I sort of have started to think that way um, from some more clips in this committee meeting. How much profit is too much profit? You're making more money than you've ever made. How much profit is too much profit? We're a big company, and the numbers are very large, uh, but it still translates right down to the bottom line at $1 per $25 of groceries. And if you consider our growth, growth in profit in 2022 is 25 times lower than the unprecedented increases in costs that are being faced by the industry and by the world. And the fact that we have lower food price inflation in Canada uh, than in so many other parts of the world world is in part due to the high functioning of our food system here and in part to the, the to the meaningful sure. effort that is being made by the grocery store industry um, to keep prices as low as possible. With respect, Mr. Weston, you, you mentioned this one dollar per grocery bit. We can put a fact in front of you. Your company is making one million dollars a day in excess profits. No one feels sorry for your profit margin when you're making a million dollars, not just in profit, in excess profit a day at the same time that Canadians are experiencing the most unprecedented inflation in their lives. How can you look a family in the eyes and tell them that that's OK, what you're doing is OK? I had a, a conversation with a customer in a store just the other day. Um, she came to me and she said something similar. She said, how can you have such exorbitant profits? And I sat down. I didn't sit down with her, but we chatted uh, for about 15 minutes. And I explained, uh, you know, what I'm explaining here to the committee. And she she understood. Um, and she said, she said, OK, I didn't realize that. That's not the way it's being characterized, um, you know, when I read the Globe and Mail or whether I re when I read the Toronto Star. And I, and I said, yeah, I, I said, look, I, I'll all I can tell you um, is that these this is the truth. This is what what's going on. And if we invested, uh, if we didn't raise retail prices as costs went up, um, we would the companies that we operate um, would disappear um, almost uh, almost I instantly. Um, and that's why this point about low profit margins is so important. A hundred percent of the total profit of the industry could go into lower food prices and the price of a grocery basket for that customer 
customer who I spoke to would own, would still be twenty four dollars. And that's not to say that? it's not important, but it, it but our our ability to to affect this change is limited. That's why we need all to How work do you square together. that? How do you square what you're saying with the fact that you're you're experiencing unprecedented profits while people are struggling? How do you square that with the record bonuses that you and and your colleagues are receiving? How do you square that with the excess profits that you're making per day? How do you square that with the record profits you're making year over year? How do you square that? It doesn't add up. Mr. Weston, people, I've got 2,000, more than 2,000 people who submitted questions saying we are struggling while you're making these record profits. That explanation does not give any solace to the people that I've heard from. Okay, so this is where thing where I think it gets rather interesting, right? Like because we have Singh here who's asking legitimate questions. Like people are seeing profits are up with with the Loblaws and all of the companies sort of underneath all the brands underneath Loblaws. The profits are up, but also grocery prices are up. So why why are you doing this to? To Canadians, why are you making groceries more expensive? Um, your profits are up. At what point is it too much profit? Um, Singh here makes some good points that I think are going to resonate with a lot of people. But I think that he's deliberately ignoring other information that other people in this committee have heard and are now taking into consideration. This is something that we specifically talked about in a previous video, one that didn't get a lot of play here on the channel. A lot of people didn't didn't really check it out um, uh, about Loblaws, um, but we went into a lot of depth in that. In that, when we, we actually looked at the financial reports, um, the the quarterly reports that the Loblaw business has to submit, and it does show in there. Yes, we're seeing growth in our profits, growth in our revenues. Okay, saying you're right. That, that's true. We're seeing growth in profits, but what they also say, not specifically in numbers not specifically in numbers, they don't have a separated category for this, but they say that that growth in profit, that growth in revenue is as a result of not the grocery store business, but from more people doing more discretionary spending um, in their their uh, their stores. So uh, more spending on cosmetics in the cos cosmetics section of, of, um, of a Loblaws or, or a real Canadian superstore or, uh, or any of these uh, sort of uh, PC brand places, Shoppers Drug Mart as well, as well as PC financial financial, right? The, the sort of banking arm of Loblaw. So what the Loblaw financial statements are saying is that yes, we, our profit has grown. They show that in a big lump in terms of the numbers, but what they don't show is the individual categories and how they grow, but they do say that we're not making more profit from our grocery stores. No, that's our least profitable area. Most of our growth and profit is from cosmetic spending as well as uh, the PC financial banking wing, uh, right? And that's something that Singh is sort of looking past here. Uh, we'll get to it in a moment, but a lot of parliamentarians in this committee are saying, okay, we've seen your financial statement, something that it seems like Singh isn't pointing his questions toward. Um, other parliamentarians are saying, okay, if we've seen your financial statements, we, we, we don't get the level of clarity in those financial statements that we want to prove that what you're saying is true. We don't get broken down into your different brands and your different subsidiaries, which ones are profitable. We just see your lump number. So some parliamentarians are saying, hey, can you provide this extra information so we can double check and verify? We're going to get into clips that sort of show that very soon, to which Weston and other CEOs reply, well, um, you can trust that our financial statements and the words we say in them are true. We don't need to show you the numbers um, because, because these statements are audited, but we'll get into that in just a moment. At all. Well, I, I understand how difficult it is for so many Canadians, and that's why we're taking decisive action within the constraints of what uh, you know we're actually able to influence. We stopped five hundred million dollars of unjustified cost increases, um, you know, in our organization. We offer the lowest prices in the market in our discount stores like No Frills and Maxi. Uh, no Frills is recognized as having the most trusted prices in in the country. We ad match uh, in our large store formats on every single ad that is available in the market. Market so the customers don't have to shop around from one store to another to make sure it's they right, get the best that, value. That does We are fix actively the losing money on core commodities, um, you know, milk, vegetable oil, butter, uh, certain cheeses, um, and all kinds of items in every single every every day of the week. Yeah, I see. I see a comment in chat here that says Russell uh, keeps simping for billionaires, saying that I'm sort of arguing for on the billionaire's behalf. I will agree that there are major problems in Canada with m people who have too much control over individual industries. We look at telecom, we look at banking. Some folks will also look at the grocery store industry and say, okay, they have too much control. What I'm getting frustrated about is um, not 
not about that issue, but is about the way that Jagmeet Singh is asking these questions, trying to go for social media clips that, that will play well to people who aren't following the situation. We'll look at other parliamentarians that are actually saying, yes, there is a problem here. We agree with you. The grocers agree there's a problem. People are paying too much for food. That is the issue, right? That is the issue. People are paying too much for food. Singh is arguing another issue. He's saying grocery stores are are taking advantage of consumers by raising prices more than it is justified to do so and uh, taking advantage of them and making record profits at the same time. There, it's almost like there's two different debates going on here, right? And, and I would sort of say that the, the points that Singh are trying to make are very good if you're not paying close attention to, to the, what's going on here and what they're saying and what the other parliamentarians are saying. Right. I, I hope that you can sort of see this distinction because I think there's a lot of problems with monopolies and, and um, centralization of power into specific industries in Canada. Uh, but that doesn't stop me from pointing out when a parliamentarian is sort of taking advantage of that perception and, and, and sort of uh, giving points that don't make an, a whole lot of sense. Week. So we are working hard on behalf of Canadians. You've still not been able to answer this basic question. Then when a family that's struggling right now looks at your profit you know, how much profit is too much profit? How much is enough? Like you're making more than you've ever made ever, ever. And you're not, you've not contradicted that point because we know it's true. How much profit is too much profit? At a time like this, when Canadians literally are saying that they are struggling, how much is too much then? Like for, for you, is there no limit to how much profit you can make? That, that at the, on the backs of Canadians that are struggling because they can't afford the groceries, there's no limit? reasonable profitability is uh, is an important part of operating a successful business. Um, I think at a dollar out of $25 of sales, that's reasonable profitability. And it's worth mentioning, you know, big numbers, um, you know, in large enterprises like ours, I, you know, let's say our profit, um, you know, was in and around $1.9 billion last year, very big number. Over two billion dollars is going to be reinvested back in this country, back into me, supermarket or back into new stores, new infrastructure, to creating jobs. It's not just about profit; it doesn't go to me. It goes the it goes back into this country. Um, so if you have reasonable, so my last question, you have reasonable for, profit no, levels, actually, and you gentlemen, have, and sorry, you, we're going to have to leave it there. I'll let you finish your your thought, Mr. Weston. Unfortunately, we're at time, Mr. Singh. I even gave you a few extra seconds to to try to make sure that was finished. So, so let me show you what I'm talking about in the way that other people have handled this and how we get down to more of the root of the issue and how we can actually get to solutions rather than looking for social media clips. Remember, I called out this kind of like crap um, when I saw the conservatives doing it last week and when I saw the liberals doing it last week and made a video showing you this is what frustrates me in these committee meetings. This is where I think that there's a lack of functionality inside of some of these committees is when you're looking for social media points, when you're looking to just look good for voters rather than getting to the root of issues, right? That, that's my point here. Let me show you this clip that I think gives a good contra contrast. It's a little bit earlier in the, uh, in the video, but we'll start here. Um, this is where um, we get a, a, a pretty good answer. Expect them to believe what you've said, which is that your profit margins haven't increased, and I think it's fair to say Canadians feel like the doubling of your profits has been literally at their expense. Something just doesn't add up here in my, in my view. Mr. Weston, to you, how do you explain the massive increase in net earnings of Loblaw, given the facts I've mentioned? Um, Thank you for your question. Uh, we're very cognizant of the cost of food prices um, and their impact on Canadians all across the country. I see it, uh, I hear it regularly when I'm, when I'm in stores talking to customers. Um, and I would uh, call into question, uh, you know, the analysis that you that you reference. Um, we look at our numbers uh, very, very closely all the time. Um, and, and I would just reiterate that our profit is one dollar on a twenty five dollar basket of groceries. Um, and if we invested 100 percent of our profits into lower prices, the price of a grocery basket would still be twenty four dollars. Okay. So as far as our profit, don't mean to cut you off, sure. but I, I so we have a difference of opinion and perhaps we're looking at different numbers. Given that, are you willing to voluntarily submit your financial statements to the Competition Bureau to clear this matter up? 
we have already submitted our financial statements to the Competition Bureau, um, and uh, you know these are um, competitively sensitive, um, you know, pieces of data, and so it's important that the Competition Bureau can see it, they can understand it, they can ask us follow-up questions, but we would be resistant, um, you know, to disclosing that type of sensitive information on a public basis. Having said that, in our financial disclosures, um, you know, we are a public company and we are held to the highest standard of transparency in our disclosures, um, and so you can see very very clearly that our one dollar of every twenty-five dollars of grocery sales is in fact an accurate representation okay. of our results. Great, thank you. Um, so, my so I so I think that that's rather interesting, and it sort of gets to what we were talking about on this channel like a month ago, in that. Everyone's asking these questions of Galen Weston and Loblaws and all of the grocers in general, but we're going to stick with Galen Weston as the main focus here because people know who he is. People have a, a bigger connection there. Um, but what Weston here is saying is that we give you all of this information that you're asking for. We show you what our profits are. We show you, uh, we tell you where our profits are coming from, right? And he says, we've submitted these financial statements uh, already. We're a public company. We have to do quarterly financial statements. And in those financial statements, you can see the revenue growth and you can see the description of where our revenue is coming from. Now, this is where I think that Weston has an easy fix. He could solve all of this issue by providing to this committee information about which sectors underneath of the law block corporation are responsible for the increased profit. Show us in the numbers your, your uh, revenue and your profit for the grocery industry specifically, and then show us where you say the profits are coming from, where you say the increased profits are coming from, um, increased uh, PC financial usage, as well as um, people buying cosmetics through Shoppers Drug Mart and things like this, not specifically groceries. That's what he claims is bringing up profits. That's what he claims is, that's that's why this is happening in, in Weston's eyes, right? That's why we have higher profits. It's not because they're hiking up grocery costs, it's because of the increased discretionary spending with PC Financial as well as um, uh, the cosmetics spending, right? But that's not inside of the financial statements as we covered on that previous video. That's not anywhere there. It just shows revenue for the entire company, not sector by sector. Weston's way out of this is just providing the numbers that show in detail what what the what the answer is here. And I think and and but he says here is that like we can't share that information because it's sensitive. Right? We don't want other grocery store competitors to see where we make the most of our revenue so that we don't get more competition inside of those areas, right? So that we don't have other grocery stores trying to go into the banking sector or, or trying to increase their cosmetic um, sales. Um, that's what he says, but that'll make people skeptical, skeptical as well, right? Like, am I, am I off base with this, with this take? Uh, I, I want to show you something else here. And this is back to Jagmeet Singh questioning uh, Galen Weston. And this is one that I think is actually rather, rather hypocritical um, because you, you'll see what I mean. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you here. And, and I, I support the NDP on a lot of fronts, right? Like I'm, this channel is quite central, but I'm going to call out stuff when I'm frustrated by stuff, no matter what political party it is. And um, that's, that's what I like to do here. Uh, let me show you at 1738. It's right here. For now, Mr. Perron, and I speak. Same mute, same mute. Okay. Yes, it is better, thank you. Line, if you'd like to just respond quickly and to Mr. Levine. I'm proud we paid Hero Pay. Um, we weren't asked to. Um, the, uh, some of the other retailers mentioned in this room that you want to hear from did not pay it. Maybe you should ask them. And we, mm -hmm. we said we would keep it in as long as there were lockdowns and that we would bring it back if regions locked down. After that, elite regions did lock down and we kept paying Hero Pay. So I'm proud of that. Mr. LaFlash, if you'd like. Uh, the part that I'm referencing is just after this. So I'll we'll watch, watch through the end of this and then we'll get to uh, where Singh sort of makes his grand dramatic uh, gesture here. To work uh, along with the other players and work at the, basically keep in line with them. Uh, to two and a half minutes, over to you. Mr. Chair, before I go to my questions, I wanted to ask um, to propose a unanimous consent motion to extend the time to hear from the witnesses to the completion of our time in this committee, and perhaps the work of committee can go to uh, another day, uh, if I can put that motion forward for unanimous consent. 
we, uh, you can certainly bring it forward. Uh, I do know that this committee uh, has other work that we were intending. I know you're not a permanent member, but uh, I'll leave it to, uh, to other committee members to decide. Yeah, Mr. Chair, respectfully, um, we haven't heard from the others, from Walmart and Costco, and until we do so, by respect to the witnesses, I mean, it's only fair that we've known this committee business was going to, this meeting was going to happen. So it's not just about, we can call back the witnesses if we need to, but before I hear from Costco and Walmart, um, I think it's only fair to the witnesses that we agreed to 115 because we do have a draft report to, to, to finish. Okay, here it is coming up now after this, this response. This is where Singh says, hey, look, look, at, look at what I'm doing. Look, look at what I'm doing here. And, then, and this is what he shared on social media recently. Unfortunately, that's not the case. But uh, Mr. Singh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Weston, you mentioned that you had a conversation with one person for 15 minutes. I have uh, 2,000 plus people that have submitted questions. Will you undertake to respond to these questions? <laughs> let, let, let me show you. This is, this is Singh saying, hey, look at this big stack of papers here. Look at, take a look at this. Look at all of the, Look at all the questions I have for you, Galen Weston. These are pe things that people submitted, probably online through some sort of email to Jagmeet Singh or to various NDP folks. 2,000 questions to ask the grocery store clerk or the grocery store CEOs. And Singh says, hey, look at this 10 pound stack of papers that I brought into this committee meeting for dramatic effect. Are you gonna answer all these questions, Galen Weston? And if you say no, you're, you, you look bad, so. You, you, better, you better say that yes, you're gonna take these papers and respond personally to every single one of these questions that I dramatically printed out. Like, way to be an environmentalist. You try, try, to, try to make a point and, and you're, you're printing off a, a tree's worth of papers. Uh, I, I found that a little bit ridiculous. Um, but let's continue with this clip because it, he, he kind of tries to corner him here and it's gonna look good as a 30 second clip, that's for sure. But uh, I think that we can sort of start, we can sort of see through, like this is being dramatic for dramatic sake. I'd certainly be delighted to, to have a look at them. I get feedback um, and, you know, I don't know if there are similar volumes. I don't want you to have a look at them. I want you to respond to I don't know if there them. are similar volumes of email that I get, uh, you know, regularly inside Loblaw and I respond to them on a case by case, on a person by person basis. And <laughs> so it's more than just one, uh, you know, one individual. Sir, I'm asking if you would respond to these questions that I'm going to table to this committee. Will you respond to these questions? I, I'd certainly be happy to take a look at them. So you're not going to respond to the questions? No, I said I'd be happy to take a look at them. And, uh, and I didn't ask you to take a look at them, though. I said, will you respond to these questions? That's an important question. If you're not going to, just say it. If you are, that's an important thing to hear. It's like he's tr trying to corner him, like, are you going to say and swear an oath that, like, that you are going to go through these two th this, this giant stack of papers and personally respond to every single one of them as the CEO of this major, major company where likely there's probably better things for you to be doing with your time. Singh's trying to make, try, trying to kind of sh smear him here with something that I'm sure that Singh wouldn't even personally do. Sit down with 2,000 plus questions and respond to them personally um, amidst his likely busy schedule. I would like to take a look at them. Um, and, you know, determine, uh, you know, what the most appropriate form of response is. Okay, so you're not committing to responding to them. Uh, I would like to t table these questions uh, to, the ch to the committee, Mr. Chair, so I have them here, and uh, I, I want to table this to the committee. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that a reasonable profit was, was something that a, a company should have, be able to make a reasonable profit. Uh, do you think a million dollars in excess profits a day is reasonable? It, it, um, it's a big number, um, especially if it you is. multiply it over the course of 350, uh, 356 days. Um, but the, the math is still the same. The math is that on the top, on, on a very, very large sales base, um, that translates into, um, a, I think it's a, a 13 cents um, of 
Uh, that incremental profit represents about 13 cents on a $25 grocery basket. And I would just reiterate um, that the cost, like we're in unprecedented times, um, global food price inflation grew 25 times faster than profits. Um, that, to me, is a, is a reasonable, fact-based proxy for an industry that is not um, taking so advantage of So just to understand, you, you think a million dollars in excess profits, not normal profits, in excess profits a day that your corporation is making with you as CEO is reasonable profit. So he's he's asking a question of the, the, of Galen Weston here, letting him respond in detail, and then his follow up question has nothing to do with the response. It's more like give me a yes or no on this thing that I can then use to say we are the only people standing up against the, these grocery store giants. The Liberals aren't doing it. The Conservatives aren't doing it. We, the NDP, are the people you should vote for because we're hammering these people hard. Like like did you hear that question? It's like. So, you, so let me be clear, you're saying that a million dollars of excess profits a day is accept, an acceptable amount of profits for your store to be making. First, what are excess profits? I believe that Singh is using this definition as, um, as profits today versus the profits that they were making prior to the pandemic. I believe that that's the number that he's using here is saying, okay, compared to that, you're making this much more profit on a daily basis than you were back at the end of 2019. So that's what your excess profit is. He doesn't, he doesn't respond to the, what, what Weston says here to sort of get any kind of more nuance that could try to get to an actual solution, parse apart the information that he's saying so you can actually try to make grocery prices lower for Canadians. It's more about getting this clip that's going to look good for people that aren't paying attention to the response and people that aren't paying attention to the issue more broadly. That that's the, that's that's how it's coming across for me. I don't know if this is off base and not what you're what you're thinking, but that's that's why I'm getting frustrated here. I don't agree with your characterization of excess profits. Um, I'm giving you the facts. Well, it's not and my character. This is a report from from a professor. I disagree with the characterization of the report from the professor. We're going um, to leave it at that, gentlemen. I described. Uh, we're at time, and, and indeed, Mr. Singh, I, I was generous in giving you a few extra minutes, uh, a few extra seconds to finish that thought. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Thank you, Mr. Singh. We're going to turn to our final round of questioning. I'm coming back uh, to the... So I just wanted to, to point that out and point out, like, how it's, it's coming from all parties. We've seen this from the Liberals. We've seen this from the NDP. We've seen this from the Conservatives. It's not necessarily that I think that the, the big grocery stores are in the right here, right? There, there are probably areas that they gouge consumers. There are probably areas that they gouge their distributors and, and their suppliers, rather. Uh, there are probably a lot of problems with an industry that cause them to be profitable. But what I'm taking issue with is the way that the, they are being questioned, the way that politicians will ask these questions without trying to get an actual answer that can get to a solution, instead trying to farm for political points. Farm, like, it's like clout farming on Twitter. Like, and we can see that like, these are the clips that were posted on Twitter directly after let me let me show you what I'm talking about here we'll go into our browser here um, and let me go to Jagmeet Singh's Twitter right because this is exactly what I was saying this is going to be your content farm for the next while and look the first thing here I posted three hours ago honestly I if I sound upset I am I do not and will not accept that it is okay that families are struggling to afford groceries while greedy CEOs feel entitled to make ref record profits and millions of dollars in bonuses. Shame on you, Mr. Weston. I'm just going through unprecedented period of cost of living crisis. We have families going into your stores, looking at the price of items, looking at them and putting them back because they can't afford them. We have families that are struggling to buy food for their kids in this country, in a G7 country. And they look at you and they see you making record profits. How can you justify that when families are struggling to put food on the table for their kids? Thank you. Um, you know, we feel uh, and understand that 95% uh, of Canadians are concerned about food prices. Um, but grocery chain profits um, are not the reason for food inflation. And as I mentioned... Profit is too much profit. Well, so a company needs some degree of profit. Record uh, you know, profits more than you've ever Mr. made. Mr. Singh, ever? how much Mr. profit is too much profit? You're making more money than you've ever Cuts out where he gets uh, reprimanded by the, the head of the committee for being too aggressive and not allowing a, a response. Ever made. How much profit is too much profit? We're a big company and the numbers are very large. 
and cuts it off there. Doesn't like this is like this is the the epitome of like message like of snipping messages to to fit whatever narrative you think that your base is going to eat up, right? Like doesn't provide any of the context that we provided here in the stream where he's saying, okay, yes, we are making more profit, but it's not as a result of our groceries. It's a result of our increased cosmetic sales and our PC financial um, banking business. Um, groceries are actually our least profitable area. Now, however much that is true, we'd like to see more data on it, but that's not something that he's trying to provide that information to, to the base. It's more like, here's what our party already believes and here's how we can make a clip that will reaffirm those beliefs amongst the people who support us and buy into our messaging, right? And, and there's lots of areas that I support the NDP. Like, I think that they did a great job fighting for, for more expanded dental care. I think that they did a great job in, in pushing for more support for individuals during the depths of the pandemic. And, and I think that there's value in the party as being a party that sort of pushes for the working class, a party that, that pushes to, to help Canadians that are struggling, um, expanding disability benefits, things like this. I think that they do a lot of good work in those areas. But that good work can be separated from instances like this where they aren't looking for the solution to a problem. They're just looking for uh, it, something that will look good when they post it on Twitter, right? This is, this is my main point and what's gotten me frustrated. Okay. Whew. All right, now I want to sort of shift gears here and talk more about the, the Bank of Canada and what just happened this week. Because at the beginning of the week, we found out that they were going to pause interest rates and that they, for this interest rate decision, they were going to keep it at that 4.25% rate. However, we got a, uh, an interview uh, and a speech from Carolyn Rogers, who is one of the high ups at the Bank of Canada, who is the the deputy uh, the deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, Carolyn Rogers. Um, the main governor is of course Tiff Mack, and we talk about him on the channel quite a lot. Carolyn Rogers, likely the one who's seen as the most likely to get the job after Tiff Macklem leaves it. Although Tiff has only been in the job for two years or so now, uh, since Stephen Polos uh, like left his chair. But let's listen in on this speech from um, from. Carolyn Rogers. Let me pull it up here because I have highlights for this too. Um, and there, there are some interesting points here and we get a better picture of what the Bank of Canada is actually, um, is actually thinking right now. Uh, what are they looking for in the economy uh, to determine whether or not they're going to raise rates more or lower them? Let, let's get into this. I, I'm actually going to give you just the highlights here. I don't want to um, have you sit through the whole thing because uh, sometimes that can get a, uh, a little bit boring uh, when we don't get to the, 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 the juicy stuff. So uh, let me uh, flip to where she starts talking about the uh, big demand coming out of the pandemic paired with wage pressures and faster costs passing to consumers. Um, this is largely what they're saying is, is a result of an overheated economy. Uh, and this is where I think uh, it starts to get interesting in this video. Which was an overheating economy here at home in Canada. Early last year, around this time, we were coming out of the Omicron wave of COVID-19 and what turned out to be the last lockdown. The Canadian economy had become increasingly resilient over the course of the pandemic, weathering each subsequent lockdown a little better than the previous. Canadians were anxious to cap catch up on the things they missed, like traveling and eating out, and so we saw some of the spending that was going into goods start to shift back to services. And even though Canadian businesses had shown remarkable resilience, adapting to multiple lockdowns, many struggled to keep up with the sudden surge in demand they faced. Supply chain issues were still with us, and staff who had, been, who had left or been laid off during the pandemic had to be rehired, retrained, or replaced. Our survey of businesses in the first quarter of last year found that four in five we're having trouble meeting the unexpected boost in demand, a record high. This pressure showed up very clearly in the labor market. The number of vacant jobs rose to nearly twice pre-pandemic levels, an obvious sign of wide, widespread labor shortages. Labor is an important input cost for businesses, particularly so in the services sector. So the shortage of available workers combined with the surge in demand for services put upward pressure on service prices. So she's talking here about why inflation got so bad 
when it did, right? When we sort of peaked out there, now we're quite a ways down at 5.9% uh, inflation year over year. Uh, we've come down a fair amount off the peaks, but she's sort of setting up here what caused them to worry so much about inflation and what was actually the root cause of that inflation. She says largely um, the, the costs of services going up uh, when the economy reopened, people were going out there and paying for new kitchens, paying for um, all, all these different types of services uh, and that paired with a tight labor market where it's hard to to hire people um, that increases wages right because you have to offer more money um, and as a result that that input cost of wages going up will cause higher costs for those services for the end consumer, which shows up in, in, an, in inflation numbers, right? This is what she's setting up here, but then she goes on further at 1930 to talk about uh, how they're dealing with it now. They Largely, she's saying, we're doing a good job now with inflation. We think that it's, it's coming down and we think we're doing a good job here, but she does talk about her fears as well. What, what does the Bank of Canada fear happening that would cause them to change their current move, right? And both will need to retreat further to get us back down. Okay, let's go has some symmetry earlier. so far. Global and domestic forces combined to drive inflation up, and both will need to retreat further to get us back down to the 2% target. So, so far I've talked a lot about how Canada's experience had a good deal in common with other countries, but there are also important differences. So let me spend a few minutes comparing where we're at on a few dimensions relative to some of our global counterparts. Our current rate of inflation, while still too high, I have to say that every time I mention inflation, is the second lowest in the G7 advanced economies. Japan is lower at 4%. And momentum in inflation, as measured by the rate of change in prices over three months, has also been close to the bottom of, G7, of the G7 countries. Importantly, uh, service, prices in, in, uh, service price inflation in Canada has leveled off in recent months, while it has continued to rise in some other countries. These rankings, of course, can move around a little in the coming, in the coming months, but they're all rankings where near, being near the bottom is a good thing. Let me now turn uh, to economic performance briefly. Canada has recorded the strongest growth in GDP in the, in the G7 since the tightening cycle began last year. And the International Monetary Fund expects Canada to have the strongest growth in the GDP uh, over the course of 2023 and 2024. That's good news, but it does underscore that our interest rate increases still need to work their way through the economy to ensure that demand cools enough for supply to catch up. Our employment growth has also been very strong compared with most of the G7. We've had the second strongest recovery in jobs and hours worked since the start of the pandemic. We've also had the fastest adult population growth fueled by immigration. And our labor force participation rate for women is at the top of the G7, helped in part by more affordable childcare. She's, she's saying that we're sort of setting up to be in a better environment here, right? We've had the largest population growth out of a, a number of different countries um, in Canada over the past number of years, um, and largest addition to the workforce um, for two reasons, she says here. One sort of is pointing to more women participating in the workforce due to lower uh, childcare costs. That's kind of sort of something that's being said in support of what the Liberal government is doing with this $10 a day childcare plan. Um, it's sort of odd for, for a bit. Bank of Canada um, official to sort of speak on something that seems like it's more um, more political policy, um, but but like not much of a mention here. So I don't think that that's absolutely egregious by by Carolyn Rogers at all. Um, and the second reason is saying, okay, yes, we've also set ourselves up to have lower inflation because of the addition to the workforce of more immigrants, more, more people coming in, new Canadians coming into the country. That's certainly an important part of immigration, right? Is to sort of the fill, fill, job, fill jobs that um, more Canadians won't fit into, right? We have a declining prop population if we, if we don't include immigration because of our lower birth rate. Now, of course, that lower birth rate is largely due to Canadians being pinched financially, not having enough to have as many kids. So maybe it's like a cart before the horse sort of thing, but immigration, Immigration in the Bank of Canada's eyes, at the very least, is a way that we can say, okay, we're not going to have as much inflation in the future because there won't be as high wage price pressures, right? More people entering the country means more people to fill jobs, more people who need work. 
more jobs filled, lower wage growth as a result because it's not as competitive of a labor market, not as tight of a labor market. So this is what she's setting up here. Um, but she does talk about what we could see if we continue to see wage increases without seeing productivity increases at the same time and how that could impact inflation and, and cause the Bank of Canada to raise rates even more. More supply of labor is a good thing because it usually means the economy can grow with less inflationary pressure. However, we continue to have one of the lowest rates of productivity in the G7. And productivity growth is important because it helps businesses pay for higher wages. If we continue to see above average wage growth that we've been seeing in Canada without some pickup in productivity, it will be very difficult to get all the way back down to 2% inflation. Households in Canada are also some yeah, so that's so that's their current their current outlook. What they're saying, like, okay, it could be it could be challenging to get back down to two percent inflation um, if if certain things go wrong. And and this is what they've said is that they're going to be looking at an accumulation of data before they make their next interest rate policy decision um, in a couple of months now. Uh, and and this is what they talk about in this next clip um, at twenty four minutes, talking about the mixed signals that we've gotten when looking at January's data, the most recent data that the Bank of Canada is able to look at at this point for for most sort of indicators. They say, uh, here are the things that kind of shocked us. Here are the things that surprised us and what could cause us to change the way that we plan on doing things in the future. When we looked at the data since January, we found a bit of a mixed picture. Overall, things unfolded broadly in line with our outlook, but we will need to see more evidence to fully assess whether monetary policy is restricted enough to get us all the way back to the 2% target. Now let me just unpack a few recent developments and share some insights into, into what we discussed and how we'll be thinking about monetary policy going forward. I'll start with economic activity. Growth in the fourth quarter of 2022 slowed a little more than expected in coming in flat. With consumption, government spending and net exports all increasing, the weaker than expected GDP was due largely to a slowdown in inventory investment. The data did show that in general, higher borrowing costs continue to weigh on sectors that are sensitive to interest rates, such as housing. They also showed that business investment has weakened as demand slows both in Canada and abroad. We also talked a lot about the labour market. Job gains in Canada have been surprisingly strong in recent months and the labour market remains very tight. With weak economic growth for the next couple of quarters, we do expect the tightness in the labour market will ease. And as it does, pressure on wages should come down. You might remember me saying that if strong wage growth isn't accompanied with strong productivity growth, it will be difficult to get back to 2% inflation. Well, we noted the data last week show labor productivity in Canada fell for a third straight quarter, so productivity isn't trending in the right direction so far. We agreed inflation is coming down largely as expected, and there's been a clear momentum shift in goods prices. So, so let's break down exactly what they're saying there, right? They're saying we've gotten some mixed signals in our data. First of all, we saw growth in Q4 of 2022 slowed more than expected. We saw GDP actually uh, um, hit 0% growth over that quarter, uh, which is more than they expected. Right? So we're not seeing as much economic uh, activity, as much productivity happening in Canada in the fourth quarter. But that's not a bad thing in the Bank of Canada's eyes because they're saying, hey, we're raising interest rates so that businesses don't spend as much, businesses don't expand as, mu as much. And a uh, sort of side effect of that is GDP sort of stalling out. We talked about that in a recent video on the channel. Um, but they say that they're also seeing another good thing in their eyes, less business investment, um, less less uh, expansion of businesses, less investment in their inventory and in their infrastructure and in, in expansion in terms of uh, how many jobs that they're creating, right? This is something that slowed down as well. Again, traditional times, we wanna see this growing. We wanna see the, the, the pie growing in Canada. Um, but in this situation where they're uh, acutely concerned about inflation, well, it's a different story. They actually kind of want to see that number go down like they did. So those are two good things in the Bank of Canada's eyes that suggest they won't need to raise rates again in the future. Now, on the other hand, jobs remain tight. The labor market remains tight. They're still seeing higher than average wage growth between 4 to 5% growth per year uh, and a, a large number of job vacancies. And they're specifically worried 
that this could cause more inflation because we're not seeing an increase of productivity while we're also seeing an increase in wage growth, right? And this is something that, um, that uh, certain labor union leaders would point to the Bank of Canada and say, hey, you're blaming the workers who haven't had price or wage increases um, that map out to inflation and the increased possible price of living. We haven't seen wage growth. And now that we're seeing wage growth, you're saying, well, that's a bad thing for the economy because it would suggest that there could be more inflation. This is something that critics will point to the Bank of Canada and say, you are waging war on the working class. Something that, um, that I forget the individual union leader that kind of went on on the news and saying all that a few months ago but th this is the one one criticism of the bank of canada is that it seems like they're blaming um wage growth for inflation another thing that they do blame though is businesses more readily passing on the costs of of uh their increased costs to consumers because there is such high demand they don't need to worry about people going to other businesses because there's such high demand that they can't satisfy it anyways with their staff and with their products. So they'll pass on the increased costs, adding to inflation, but they're saying that that's starting to get back down to, to normal. So I thought that that was rather interesting from, from what Carolyn Rogers said. Now there's also um, some points here on the, the Bank of Canada's views on the US dollar and the Canadian dollar. Uh, that's one thing that people have po pointed towards saying, hey, like, we're worried about the Canadian dollar losing value relative to the U.S. dollar. Um, will you step in if it loses a certain amount of value? To that, she says, no, we're not going to step in. We don't target anything like that. But it is something that will work into our future um, reports and our future information, right? Because if the U.S. dollar is higher and then the Canadian dollar and that gap spreads in that direction, well, then it becomes more expensive for Canadians to import things from the U.S. because our dollar goes um, not as far, right? But on the flip side, our businesses in Canada become more competitive because other people can buy things for Canadian dollars and their dollar is strong. Like U.S. will want to import from Canada more. So it's helpful for those businesses. So it's kind of like you have to take both of those things into consideration. Now, something that I absolutely want to talk about today is the impact, the structural impact on the economy when someone raises interest rates as quickly as the, the Bank of Canada has been doing. And we're sort of starting to see signs that, okay, things can get a little wonky when we go from 10, 15 years of near zero interest rates to a world where interest rates are around 5%, right? We look at the states and the Federal Reserve continuing to jack up interest rates. And now we're starting to see the ramifications of this. We already saw it in some housing market declines, um, but not as structurally important to the economy. If you're not familiar with the situation that's going on, I wanna talk about SVB, um, that's Silicon Valley Bank, a bank that has just gone under, just absolutely collapsed in the past two days. FDIC, um, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, I believe that's what the, the acronym is, had to step in and actually sort of custody this bank, take go into receivership, uh, or the, the bank went into receivership with them as the receiver, uh, dealing with this issue. Now, this is the impact of high interest rates uh, now when we had such low interest rates before. I don't know, have you been following this story? Let me know in chat if you've been following this story and uh, how much detail I should go into exactly what's happened. Because um, you might be already up to date with it, but maybe I should go into a little bit more detail and looking at chat right now. Eric's been following it. Sandra's been following it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people, and some people are saying more banks to come. Yeah, Justin, yes, following it a little. Um, explain for them. Yeah. Okay. So I'll give, I'll give a brief explainer. Now I don't have any more information than anyone else does with this. And I, I've been sort of following this um, on the side. So I'll do my best to explain it for you. Um, maybe I'll open up um, Excalidra, my little software here that I use to draw, draw things for, for explainer videos. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. That works. So we have uh, that's way too big. <laughs> I'm going to explain to you here what's happening with SVB Bank, right? We have SVB stands for Silicon Valley Bank. Now, if you don't already know, they have collapsed over the past while. Um, and there, it's largely due to 
the way that banks work, right? We have something in in North America and in most most sort of developed countries in the world it, that is fractional reserve banking, right? Fractional reserve banking, which essentially means a bank doesn't need to keep as much money on hand, uh, specifically like in cash, as they have deposits, right? So let's say uh, I'll bring in. Okay, like come on, uh, where? Let's exit Zen mode. Where are you, library? I want to bring in a, a little little person here. Okay, perfect. We'll bring in this little user. So let's say that we have all, like all of these five people all looking at SVB Bank and using SVB Bank, right? They're gonna deposit their money and we'll just say there's five units of money here that people have deposited at SVB Bank. Now SVB Bank doesn't have to keep five units of money in here. They'll probably just keep one of them and then with the other four, they have to sort of use this money to make some sort of profit here by lending it out to other individuals or by holding um, debt instruments that will pay them interest, right? So SVB Bank took in a whole bunch of deposits from different companies and different individuals during the pandemic when interest rates were extremely low and they said, hey, we have all of this money right now, but we can't just hold it on our books because we need to make a, at least a little bit of an interest rate return on it so that we can give a little bit of an interest rate to the, the people who are depositing here. So they went out and bought a whole bunch of, of bonds, right? Bonds that they were planning to hold until maturity. Um, so they said, okay, we're gonna park our money in this 1.5% interest rate bond. And, uh, and once it goes to maturity, we'll have all that money back and it will be the money that we give back to individuals. And this is something that's kind of typical of what banks do, right? They're going to sort of lend out money um, in order to uh, sort of become more profitable as a bank and, uh, and, and they don't necessarily have to have all the money on hand, right? So that, that's the main point I'm making here. Now, this is how all banks operate for the most part is they don't have, it's fractional reserve. They don't have all the money on hand, which means that if all of a sudden, it's not just these five people, but every single depositor that has ever, <laughs> ever been a part of this bank, all of a sudden, if they say, hey, I heard rumors that you're going under, I want my money right now. Every single person says, give me my money, give me my money, give me my money, give me my money, give me my money. They can't give the money to everybody, right? Because they don't have all of that cash on hand for every single depositor that has a deposit at SVB. So that's what happened here. And this is this is, describes a bank run. You've heard of bank runs before. That's what happened here. It's a bank run. Um, so that, that's having big impacts here. And, and one of the, the big problems is, right, that they were, because interest rates have gone up, their holdings in these bonds that they were previously sort of just holding there as representation of the, the deposits, making a little bit of interest. But because interest rates went up dramatically, bonds have an inverse relationship with the interest rates on those bonds. Um, so when essentially when interest rates go up, bond prices go down, the value of the bonds go down. Doesn't matter if you can hold the bonds to maturity because then you just get the amount that you, you paid for the bond when it was created, right? But if you're forced to sell these bonds before maturity, well, then you have to take the market price. Because central banks raised interest rates so dramatically, SVB, when this bank run happened, had to sell all of their bonds or, or a lot of their bonds that they were planning to hold until maturity, they had to sell those bonds uh, to, to pay their depositors, right? And they had to take a big loss on that. And at that point, they didn't have enough money because they had to take such a large loss that they weren't expecting. Now it became clear, we don't have all the money that we need to give you all your money. And that even stoked concerns further, amplifying the, the bank run. Now this has a big impact on the on both the US economy, of course, like we, we've talked about that, but also it could have ramifications for the Canadian economy as well. Yeah, sim similar to a Credit Suisse situation, Alex. Yeah, there are certainly similarities there that we're seeing. I hope this is making sense. Does anyone have any questions about what exactly happened here? Because I wanna flip over to a couple of articles here that are talking about uh, SVB Bank in the context of Canada specifically. because uh, it seems like this isn't just a Silicon Valley issue, at least not anymore, right? Because we look at this headline, SVB doubled its Canada loan book in the year before the collapse. Oh, let me actually like outline the impact of what, hap what this means. SVB is largely not individual depositors like individual people, me and you, some, some, some are that, 
but um, the, the vast majority of their business is from startups, right? Startup technology, or startups um, that are in Silicon Valley, not just tech startups, but lots of tech startups banked with SVB um, because they sort of uh, specialized in helping these types of businesses get loans and, and um, sort of store their money. Um, so a lot of these early stage startups are have all their funds sort of locked up in SVB. And it's likely that they're going to get a lot of that back. Um, the FDIC has sort of stepped in here and is sort of taking responsibility, but they don't know when they're going to get their funds back. This means that a lot of startups couldn't, aren't going to be able to make payroll or may not be able to make payroll. Um, and, and many startups might not survive this. Uh, and the people are worried that th this happening to SVB might shake people's confidence in other banks, other s smaller banks, and have people sort of do the same sort of run on the bank that happened here with SVB and that this could spread and become a, a contagion. Now, we don't really know if that's what's going to happen here, if this is going to be sort of a mass 2008 type thing. I think likely not given the additional regulations that have sort of been put in place both in the US and, and in Canada, but that's what people are, are concerned about, um, especially given headlines like this. SVB doubled its loan book in Canada the year before its collapse. Um, okay, let's see if we can... Okay, I let me let me show you this trick on how I get past um, the 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 ad blocks on these news sites. I'm gonna copy the uh, the title, paste it into uh, Google, and then we find we find the individual article. Yep, right here, and then we can actually go on these three little dots here and click cached. And Google has a cached version of the of the whole story that's not actually on the web page, but it's just like Google's version of it that they've stored, and we can read the whole thing. SVB Financial Group's Canadian unit doubled the size of its loan portfolio last year as it sought to capitalize on the growth of the country's technology sector, regulatory filings show. The Canada division, which received a license to open in 2019, ended last year with $435 million Canadian in secured loans. Um, okay, so secured loans that... There, it's it's against something. That was a tiny part of SVB's balance sheet, but it was twice the 212 million in loans the bank reported a year earlier. So they doubled the size of their balance sheet here. SVB or SBV, that's wrong. It's SVB <laughs> had only a foreign bank branch license, so it wasn't eligible to take retail deposits. This is this is good for folks in Canada, meaning retail users, individuals like you and me, won't be affected by this. Um, uh, another key point that I didn't bring up is that FDIC much like um, CIDC in Canada, will insure deposits at banks up to a certain amount. For the FDIC, that's $250,000. So people who had under $250,000 in SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, will get all of that money back via uh, FDIC insurance, something that we have in Canada to CIDC, right? Uh, but the, the issue here is that it's not mostly retail users here that are that are affected by this. It's largely businesses, right? With a That might have a very high burden rate, a very high, um, uh, very high costs, a very high payroll, um, such that they don't only have $250,000 in the bank. Um, they could have far more than that. And in fact, 90, I think it was around 95% of all deposits in a Silicon Valley bank would not be FDIC insured. So most people were holding more than $250,000 in these accounts. And that's the maximum that they're insured in the case of a, a bank meltdown like this. Canadian customers included e-commerce software provider Shopify. Oh, let's see what Luke uh, Tobias Luke, the CEO, says about this. And pharmaceutical company HLS Therapeutics, according to a previous statement by the bank, they provided us debt financing early and as we grow, uh, or as we grew, the co-founder of the, of Credit Score, uh, Borowell from Canada, said on Twitter on Friday, shortly before Silicon Valley Bank collapsed in the biggest U.S. bank failure since 2008. Yeah, this is the biggest <laughs> bank collapse since the uh, the great financial crisis of 2008. Graham said that the company didn't have any current loans or accounts with SVB. He described the bank's demise as shocking and sad. And I think it is shocking and sad, right? Um, if this material Im materially impacts um, how how many startups there are, um, both in U.S. and Canada, and, and it sort of impacts all of these individuals who are working at startups, largely for less salary than the market rate, because they often will take sort of equity in the company, you know, stock options and things like that, to take a, a lower salary. All of these people 
may not get paid on Monday or, or their next payday, right? If, if assets are still tied up here, many of these companies won't survive. Many of even the, the venture capital uh, firms might not survive, the ones that fund this technological innovation. Now, some people will say, okay, well, it's just the, the richy VCs and we're not, this isn't a concern of us. But if there is, if there's contagion here, well, then it could have a wider ranging impact. And that's why I sort of wanted to talk about it at least here, even if we don't know what the full impact of this is gonna be. And there's another article here that I wanted to take a look at. Yeah, because this doesn't just impact the individual, these individual businesses, right? Um, it also impacts the stock prices of other businesses, right? And that's something that applies directly to Canada. Um, let me show you this. I'm gonna do, use the same trick here so we can read it. Um, maybe I shouldn't be sharing these tricks so that they don't go and fix it so I can't use them anymore. <laughs> Okay, yeah, let me go, let me, let me make this a better view for you. There we go. Because with the SVB contagion fears, Silicon Valley Bank contagion fears, the fact that people are worried that this could spread to more and more banks, well, that's causing people to lose faith in the Canadian big banks, erasing $19.7 billion in value. People are like, hmm, I'm starting to see a bank banking sort of collapse happen here. Maybe this could expand out into more. Again, I'm not saying that it will. Um, I don't think anyone knows for certain right now which way this will go. Um, but people are, are worried that like, hey, I'm invested in the big banks. Is this bad for them? And it seems like in terms of their share price, certainly is. Look at this. The fallout from Silicon Valley Bank's collapse has led to a continent-wide sell-off in financial stocks, erasing nearly $20 billion um, from Canada's top banks in the last four days, um, including uh, uh, Scotiabank, BMO, TD Bank, um, they fell more than 2% on Friday, which is a big fall for these major staple, um, what people would consider blue chip stocks. Uh, probably the, the, the largest drop since the, the, the pandemic fears, uh, almost exactly what, like three years ago, almost exactly three years ago in March. So I think that that's pretty wild, pretty wild. Large Canadian banks have acquired regional U.S. banks in recent years, increasing their exposure to the banking fallout from the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. Ah, interesting. I've, I've been reading about this. So there's Canadian banks that actually own smaller U.S. banks. And, and there's actually like a merger going on, I believe, um, where they were trying to, uh, for where... Um, BMO is trying to buy out uh, another U.S. regional bank, but it, people are worried if these regional banks, people lose faith in them and there's a run on the bank and they have fractional reserve banking as well, like all banks do, that this could negatively impact can can Canadian banks because of their ownership in these smaller banks. Liquidity positions across the Canadian banks are strong, um, says CIBC. So they're saying, hey, we're fine, don't worry. Deposits in the U.S. fell 2% in the latter half of last year, while Canadian deposits rose 4%. Huh. We do not think that deposit trends will force the liquidation of bond holdings similar to SVB. This is what we described before, right? The deposit trends, they're talking about inflows and outflows. They're saying, we don't think that in Canada, people are going to all ask for their money at the same time because they lose faith in the banks. Because the U.S. has been losing faith for a while. Their deposits fell 2% in the past year. In Canada, our deposits went up 4%, so Canadians are still more confident in their banks. Uh, we don't think that the deposit trends will force the liquidation of bond holdings similar to SVB. Remember, the reason SVB went down is because everyone asked for their money at the same time and that forced the bank to sell their bond holdings that they were going to hold until maturity. They were going to get that money back if they had more time, right? Because you just get the, the amount that you sort of paid for the bond if you, you bought it right at the creation of the bond. You get that money back at the end of the mature, at the mature, when that bond matures, right? Uh, so they would have gotten all the money back plus whatever interest rate that they were being paid on that bond, but they're forced to sell it early. Now you have to sell into the market rate, the market value of those bonds at the given time, which is uh, dramatically lower than what it was previously because of the higher interest rates that, uh, that we're sort of experiencing right now. There could be other consequences though. TD is the largest shareholder in Charles Schwab, a, a big US bank. It's a Texas-based brokerage that's on track for its uh, worst two-day drop in years in terms of the stock value of it, I'd imagine. Um, and TD is in the process of acquiring First Horizon Corp, um, another U.S. bank, and risk premiums in, for U.S. regional banks have increased materially, he said. First Horizon shares fell as much as 6.7% Friday. So I, I don't know what you think about this. Is this something that you're that you're worried about? Do you think that the contagion could spread and it could have a lar larger ranging impact? I know that a lot of people 
in the States. And this is sort of a, an industry that I'm involved with, like in the work that I, that I do on top of the YouTube channel. I also work um, in, for doing coding and, and management for, for a couple different tech companies. And, and they're worried right now, right? It's because if, you, if you're managing your payroll through SVB, well, that, that's a big issue for one. But also, what is your exposure with other banks? Is this going to be contagious? Is this something that's going to happen at another bank? And if people start worrying about it, well, then the likelihood of that contagion happening actually goes up, right? Now, on top of this, also SVB was a big holder uh, or what uh, had a lot of USDC's uh, reserves in it. USDC is a stable coin, a crypto token um, that is supposed to sort of stay pegged to $1. Uh, and because they have reserves for uh, at that value at very various different banks so that they can say, okay, every dollar that you're sort of trading in this crypto coin is backed by this federally regulated treasury that we're holding at many different banks. The issue being SVB was one of those banks. So now USDC, which is supposed to be a stable coin, um, trading at $1 has lost its peg. It's now around 95% sense. So people are worried about how, like, what is the long-term credibility of USDC? And I know that a lot of um, Web3 and crypto-focused startups use USDC as their sort of payment rails for their payroll. Um, so that could be an issue as well. If that loses peg, that could be, that could be a big issue. So yeah, <laughs> it's pretty wild. And I don't know which way it's going to actually go long-term. I, I don't know if it's going to be a major, major impact in Canada. Or, or around the world, but I figured I'd at least bring you this story so you can have a little bit of understanding. Yeah, so we covered a lot today. We covered the frustration I've had with the committee meetings, um, specifically with Singh, sitting in on a committee meeting that he's not normally a part of to try to get Twitter clips, right? That's what it seems like, not trying to work towards a solution. That That's my take on the situation. I could be wrong, I'm just a dude on the internet talking, right? But that, that's my interpretation of the situation, frustrating. Two, what the Bank of Canada is thinking, what would happen if, what, what would it take for them to change their direction? What would it take for them to raise rates again? What would it take for them to lower rates again? And what would it take for them to continue to pause? Now this, all this banking collapse um, uh, hysteria is something that could say, hmm, maybe there are structural risks to raising interest rates dramatically as we saw with SVB being forced to sell their bonds at an extremely low rate because, or at an extremely low price because of the high interest rates, right? Bonds have an inverse sort of relationship. Bond prices have an inverse relationship with the yields on those bonds, right? So that's that's how that's impacted by the central banks. So so that's interesting too. Interesting too. We got all that information from Carolyn Rogers in that press conference, and then going into more depth with this SVB situation that's ongoing. One thing we didn't cover today is election interference. We're getting sort of closer to the end of the stream now, so we're maybe we'll save that for another day because there is more that has come out on that front, more from Sam Cooper in, in Global News. Um, but that story also it sort of feels like the Liberals have done a good job in their eyes of okay, we're going to put a special rapporteur out. Uh, and we're going to choose that person in three weeks. Hopefully the media storm has died down about it because we haven't been doing things as rapidly. And it seems like they might be able to dodge the flack here for that situation. But we can talk about that in another day. Matthew Semenik says, Russell, do you know if there is insurance we can purchase for our Canadian deposits above and beyond CDIC for higher um, GICs? Yeah, so I believe in Canada... The CDIC insurance is up to $100,000. I might be mistaken there, but we've got $100,000 per institution. So this is not financial advice. This is just something to consider and look into and, and check out for yourself. But if you have more than $100,000 at a, one financial institution in Canada, it might be a wise decision to look into other institutions that you can hold that money at so that you're sort of doubly CIDC uh, insured, right? Because it's on an institution by institution basis, to the best of my understanding. So if you have, if you, if you're in a, a positive situation where you have two hundred thousand dollars in the bank at CIBC, then perhaps it might be good to look into diversifying the banks that you hold that at. However, these are very big banks in Canada. There's less regional banks uh, in Canada to the extent that the U.S. is. There are more credit unions and things like this, and we do have tighter regulations in Canada, tighter banking regulations here. 
We've seen OSFI raising um, the, the domestic stability buffer, requiring banks to have more cash on hand in case of a situation like this. So it seems that we're already taking steps in Canada to make sure something like this doesn't happen. But that's something I might look into is just how can we, how can you get more CDIC insurance? I'm not sure how you can privately insure deposits above and beyond CDIC. I'm not, not sure about that, Matthew, but good question now. Uh, John says CDIC is per account type with the institution. Okay. That's interesting. So saving, like a savings and, and checking account and then maybe a TFSA as well, that type of thing. I, I need to look into that a little bit more, but definitely something to look into for the the, the, the lucky ones among us that are sitting with over $100,000 in, in, in the bank, which I know most, most Canadians aren't. Yeah, any, any final questions here as we sort of wrap up the stream here? I appreciate everyone for, for tuning in and for subscribing to the channel and liking it and, and hitting the notification bell so you can find out when I'm live next time. I appreciate you for doing that, uh, especially when you like and subscribe. It helps this channel uh, get more get seen by more people. And if you appreciate this kind of analysis, I, I appreciate the support on that front. But any final questions before we wrap this up, you can do at Russell Matthews in the chat and I'll see it. It'll highlight for me in bright orange on my little chat screen here. Yeah, thanks, Robert Hurst. Thanks for what you do, man. Love the channel. Love that you're enjoying it, Robert. Are you going to talk about bail-ins now? Yeah, that will bail bailouts is what a lot of people are considering with SVG Bank, but it doesn't seem that the, the, the bank itself and the investors in that bank will be bailed out. It's likely that the bank will dissolve, but depositors will be bailed out. That's where I sort of see things going right now, based on what Janet Yellen said earlier this morning. Yeah, 100 feet of yellow curtain. Good topic, get discussion going. Yeah, silver, gold, food, and protected to your best ability. Thinking it's getting there. It's not getting better under this government. Yeah, I know lots, lots of people are sort of turning to, like, how can I hedge hedge against the, the, the system that we're in not being as structurally sound as we, we, as we thought it was? Clan Holmes says, are you going to talk about the news bills later, B11, B18? That would be actually really interesting to talk about. Um, the, 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 the new bills and how Google is treating news now on social media and whether or not we, we think we're going to backtrack this. I'll put that, lock that in the safe in the back so I can remember to talk about that because that's an interesting situation that admittedly I need to dig into a little bit more before I go online and, and talk about it because I followed it a lot when those bills were being drafted but I'm not exactly sure what Senate amendments were actually involved in it so I need to I need to get clear on that. Sheldon Forbes says the Bank of Canada doesn't care about the purchasing power of Canadian dollar would you say it's the wrong move? Well I mean whether or not it's the wrong move for the Bank of Canada to not directly target an exchange rate for the the Canadian dollar is 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 fact right like that's not something that they target and not something that their mandate has them target right they review that mandate every five years and if they say okay we actually want you to target the dollar um then then they would have to do so now whether or not I think that it, it's a good thing or a bad thing that the Canadian dollar is is going down relative to the U.S. A lot of a lot of folks will say, okay, well, that could force the hand of the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates further to build more credibility. But I think that they'll only do that if they see that this is going to have an impact on inflation in Canada. That is what they're worried about right now, not the exchange rate. It could be inflationary to have a lower Canadian dollar because it costs more for U.S. goods to be imported. But at the same time, the flip side of that is that maybe more businesses do well when they're sort of selling to other countries because the Canadian dollar is worth less than it was before, right? So the Bank of Canada said, we're going to take all of these things into consideration and include it in our next report, but we're not going to specifically target any kind of exchange rate here. Yeah, good, good question. And uh, Diogenes the Great, apologies if I <laughs> pronounced that wrong. Um, why do you ignore the law of supply and demand in your analysis, Jagmeet Singh? Oh, yeah. Th th yeah, that, that, that's a frustrating element as well, right? It's like, I think getting to the root of it is just like, you can sort of tell when politicians are trying to get to a solution and when they're trying to create something that will look good to their base, right? And Pierre Polyev does this a lot too, right? Like there's a lot of times where I think that like, why are you sort of using a catchy slogan to, to describe like taxes going up, right? Like, like it, it seems like it's sort of pandering to to a set group of individuals that will just 
not buy in or not look into the issues as deeply and we're only hearing that surface level sort of stuff even if all of the stuff that he's saying is correct and all of all of the all of the points that are trying to be made are correct when you look into it further it's still frustrating to see soundbite politics right where you're just trying to get something in in question period that looks good on twitter right <laughs> that that's frustrating no matter which political party and the NDP do it, and certainly the Liberals do it too. I think that that's just a dysfunction in Canadian politics that happens. Yeah, Sh Sheridan saying, so do you think that the Great Canadian Pace is coming? Uh, sort of saying that um, we, we're, our dollar is going to become far less valuable. I don't see that long-term happening uh, unless there's like the U.S. really, really raises rates further and the Bank of Canada doesn't change their macro policy, right? Their... their macroeconomic policy with the Bank of Canada. I don't see that really happening in terms of relativity. I, I do sort of see less global dominance of government currencies long-term, like talking 20, 30 years here, um, those becoming less valuable relative to to um, what, what might come in the future, central bank digital currencies or even uh, decentralized digital currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. I can sort of see a trend there that perhaps there might be less credibility in these major institutions. So we, we turn to these decentralized, um, uncontrolled, by any central government uh, sort of types of currencies. But I don't think that relative to the, the US dollar, the Canadian dollar will depreciate that much sig more significantly than it already is right now. Good question though. Okay. I think that's going to be it for today, everyone. But th thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, and again, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you keep on getting updates. And um, the notification bell specifically, if you like these live streams, it'll actually send a ping to your phone when I go live. I don't typically announce these ahead of time because I'm my schedule's kind of up in the air, so I can only do it when I do it, you know, and I only know that the morning of or something like that. So that notification bell is really important for you to... to to find out when I'm doing these live streams. But with that said, thanks so much for watching everybody. Hope this stream helped you out a little bit. Um, and I appreciate you all for being here again. I get to know you a little bit better. Um, hopefully this gave you a little more insight into these issues and um, more to come in, in the following weeks and months. The big budget coming up in March or in May, May? No, March, end of March, end of this month is when Christopher Freeland's tabling the budget. That's always a, a pop in time on the channel because there's a lots of changes with the, the finances of Canada. And I think that's what we talk about most here on the channel. So appreciate you all being here. Happy Sunday. Hope you got enough sleep with the daylight savings. That's something that we should take away is daylight savings time. Uh, that, that'll be a whole nother rant. Anyways, peace everyone. Have a good rest of your Sunday.